Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Before we start, I would like to make an announcement that if you signed up for the social dinner to collect here at 8 o'clock in front of the building, there will be a bus. Uh, yes. Well, ideally, but before, because the bus will leave at 8 o'clock. Yeah, 7.45 is the target, and then uh, the bus will actually leave at 8. If you're Dutch or German, you can just come at 8. If you're Italian or Spanish, then you come at 7.45. Uh, so this session, I don't know about Americans, but so this session is uh, different from the previous ones. We will have five short talks, 12 minutes each, followed by maybe one or two questions. And these talks will be by students and postdocs who won one of the abstract awards. These are Kerry Bailey, Ethan Knights, Pier Matteo Morucci, Mikal Ramot, and Simona Vicano. So congratulations to students. Okay, we'll, uh, this is a, the list was in alphabetical order, by the way. So first, Kerry. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for the award. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. So today I'm going to be talking about the first study of my PhD, which is on decoding the sound of hand-object interactions in the early smart sensory cortex. So to give a bit of background on my PhD, uh, my research is essentially interested in how context and prior experience can shape processing in the earliest sensory areas of the brain. And when I refer to the early sensory areas, I'm talking about the primary areas of cortex, like primary visual cortex, primary smart sensory cortex, and primary auditory cortex. And I'm interested in how prior experience can shape processing in these areas. So there's two different ways that we can look at this. So first of all, there's the feed-forward pathway. The feed-forward pathway is very stimulus-driven. For example, you could see a visual stimulus in the real world, and this would enter the primary visual cortex before being sent up to higher level areas, which process the information in a more complex manner. However, it's also important to um, take into consideration the feedback pathway. And this pathway allows for a way for prior experience in the current context to shape responses in these early sensory brain areas. And this ties in nicely with the theory of predictive coding. So the theory of predictive coding essentially states that all regions of cortex are continuously predicting upcoming input based on our prior experience of the world. And this can happen both within and across modalities. So I was given an example in the visual cortex. However, if you see an image of, say, a wine glass, you know what it feels like to touch that wine glass based on prior experience. So information could be fed back to um, early smart sensory cortex too, which processes the tactile information. And this was found nicely in a study in 2015. So in the MRI scanner, they show participants these three familiar categories of a wine glass, a mobile phone, or an apple. And they showed these to participants based on the idea that they should have this um, familiar interaction with them. They know what it feels like to touch those objects. And they also showed participants these unfamiliar object categories with the assumption that they do not have this prior experience of knowing what it feels like to touch these objects. And they had the expectation that the familiarity with the, with the familiar objects should send information to the early smart sensory cortex, even though they're only viewing the pictures of the objects. And this is what they found. So you can see here that the lighter gray bars show decoding effects for right and left and pulled postcentral gyrus for the familiar object categories. However, the unfamiliar objects do not show the same decoding effects. So it suggests that it's this prior experience of the tactile properties of the objects that's being sent to the postcentral gyrus. So this study looked at the links between vision and touch. And other researchers also looked at these cross-modal effects. For example, Maya looked at the links between um, Maya et al. in 2010 looked at the links between uh, vision and audition, so they showed participants these silent but sound-implying video clips and found that they could find activity in the auditory cortex, even though no auditory information was present. And Vetter, Smith, and Mugley in 2014, the same between um, audition and vision, so they played these sounds of rich visual scenes and found that they could find activity in the early visual cortex. However, no research to date has looked at the links in the same way between audition and touch, and this is where my study comes in. So I was interested to see if these cross-modal effects are still apparent when participants are hearing the pure sound of a familiar hand-object interaction, um, but to see if um, effects can be sent to the postcentral gyrus in the absence of tactile stimulation. For example, um, a sound of a hand-object interaction could be typing on a keyboard or bouncing a basketball, and as I said, the pure sound um, could project information over the postcentral gyrus. We would expect this to be the case because associative links are usually formed between the two. Um, 
for example, you would hear the sound of typing on a keyboard in day-to-day -day life at the same time as typing on a keyboard at the same time. So since these associative links, you would expect this to be the case. So to give a background on the methods, we had 10 right-handed participants in the MRI scanner, and they listened to three different object categories. So first of all, we had our familiar hand object interactions. For example, we had typing on a keyboard, and I've got an example here. decided to have two control categories. So first of all, we decided to have a control category matched on familiarity, but should not convey the same type of tactile information. Um, and we decided to choose animal calls based on a pilot experiment. Dog barking. I don't know if that worked properly. Um, but uh, yeah, so we decided on this familiarity control to say that it's not just any familiar sound can be decoded in the post-central drivers, but it's actually the familiar and sound with the, uh, with the haptic interactions of the objects as well. And we also decided to have this unfamiliar control category of pure tone stimuli, so we can then say that it's not just any tone, any sound can be decoded in the post-central gyrus. So I've got an example. And these are as unfamiliar as a, a tone can be. You've heard tones in day-to-day -day life, but they shouldn't really convey any familiarity of any sort. And we had five examples of each of these categories, so five hand object interactions, five animal calls, and five pure tones. And we normalized all of these to the root mean square. In the scanner, participants performed a one back repetition counting task. So they counted how many times they had the same sound repeated twice in a row. And then they verbally told us at the end of a run how many repetitions they heard. This therefore eliminated any need for a motor response. Therefore, if we find activity in the post central gyrus, it could be claimed to not be due to the task at hand and participants were fixated on a central fixation cross for the entire experiment. At the very end of the experiment, they completed this independent finger mapping localizer. So we attached these stimulator pads to the um, index finger, ring finger, and palm of the right and left hand of the participants, and they just vibrated on their hands so we could localize the hand-sensitive area in the brain. So to define the post-central gyrus, we did these hand-drawn anatomical masks. So an example of one participant can be seen here. We've got left and right anatomical masks of the post-central gyrus. The blue box on the right depicts the, all of the axial slices that were used in this particular participant. The reason we did this um, was because there's many different subregions of the post-central gyrus, and we wanted to ensure that we covered all of these subregions. And the same... Um, but Smith and Goodale and Meyer et al. also did the same in their studies, so we thought this would be the best approach to adapt. So this was our main region of interest. However, we also had some additional regions of interest we were interested in looking into. And we used the ULIC anatomy toolbox to look into this, so we had the um, primary auditory cortex, premotor cortex, and motor cortex that we were also interested in looking into. So back to the research question. We were interested in whether we can decode the pure sound of a familiar hand-object interaction in the early smart sensory cortex. So we had our five different hand-object interactions, the sound of typing on a keyboard, knocking on a door, bouncing a basketball, crushing paper, and soaring wood. We were interested to see whether the pure sound of, this active, of, of, the, the pure sound of these hand-object interactions could elicit activity in the post-central gyrus. We used multivoxel pattern analysis to see if we could train a classifier to significantly discriminate between the different patterns of activity elicited. So for example, a pattern of activity could be elicited for typing on a keyboard versus a different pattern of activity for crushing paper. And the, the classifier, um, we, claimed, we, we predicted that the classifier would be able to significantly discriminate between the different patterns of activity. There should be different patterns since um, they all convey different types of tactile information. We also trained the classifier to do the same thing for our animal calls. So again, we have five different categories of animal calls. And the same again for the pure tones. However, we would not expect this to be the case since both of these categories do not really convey the same type of tactile information. So to move on to the results, first of all, looking into the primary auditory cortex, we'd expect to find very high decoding effects because it's an auditory study, so the auditory cortex should be able to decode which sound was heard. And indeed, we find this to be the case. So you can see here the chance line is at 20%, um, as there were five different categories and in each condition. And yeah, strong decoding effects for hand object interactions, animal calls, and pure tones. And we actually find a really nice effect where the pure tones are actually significantly higher in the right hemisphere than our other two categories, which a low level model of auditory cortex function would expect as they don't really convey any other type of information or familiarity. Moving into the post central gyro 
find some really interesting results. So first of all, we looked into our hand-drawn anatomical masks as a whole, and you can see here that we find significant decoding activity in the right, the left, and the pooled right and left, post-central gyrus, only for the hand-object interactions. So we do not find any significant decoding in this area of our control categories of animal calls and pure tones. It's only hand-object interactions, which really does suggest it's this tactile information that's being sent over. And then we looked into the finger-selective voxels. So from that localizer in the scanner, um, we, we took the top 100 most selective voxels from this finger pad localizer and did the same analysis again. And we see here that we find very strong decoding activity again in the left post-central gyrus for the hand-object interactions. And even more interestingly, this is significantly higher than both of our control categories, which did not show significant decoding effects. We also looked into the premotor and motor cortices as well as additional analyses, and we find some similar findings. So first of all, in the premotor cortex, again, you see significant decoding right, left, and premotor, uh, um, and pooled premotor cortex for the hand-object interactions. And again, in the motor cortex, we see significant only for the hand-object interaction in the left motor cortex. So again, we do not find significant decoding for the, hand, for the animal calls and the pure tones. So just to summarize, this study has found that here in the pure sound of a familiar hand-object interaction can elicit different patterns of activity in the early smart sensory cortex. And just to emphasize, this is in the complete absence of any actual tactile stimulation. And we found no significant decoding for the animal calls and the pure tones. So it really does suggest it's this prior experience with the, um, the feel of the objects, um, like the typing on the keyboard, as opposed to just familiarity or any sound as a whole. And when we look into the selective voxels of the left smart sensory cortex, we find that the decoding is actually significantly higher for our hand-object interactions when compared to both of our con control categories, which is a really interesting finding. Again, it suggests it's this prior tactile information with the objects that's being sent over. And premotor cortex also shows this same reliable decoding effects of familiar hand-object interactions. So overall, this suggests that cross-modal connections from audition to early smart sensory cortex can transmit this content-specific information about familiar hand-object sounds. And this ties in really nicely with the study by Smith and Goodale, who found the same thing between vision and touch, but we have now found, replicated the study to an extent, but from audition to touch instead. And just to summarize, this is broadly consistent with the theory of predictive coding. So as I said, the theory of predictive coding essentially states that all regions of cortex are continuously predicting upcoming input, based on our prior experience. So prior experience of knowing what it feels like to touch the keys on the keypad is um, sending information over to early smart sensory cortex, even when you're only hearing the sound of this. So thank you very much. <laughs>Two short questions. Um, the first question is, uh, it seemed like you had selected um, uh, hand actions that uh, some were more similar to each other than others. And I was wondering whether you did that so that you could look to see whether the similarity of patterns evoked by, for example, a palmed uh, hand action like the basketball versus a finger action like the keyboard, whether that's part of the plan to see whether you see the similarity function. And then the, the second question is even shorter, uh, which is, um, it seems like to say that this has anything to do with a pathway from audition to motor, you would need to show somehow that these effects were different than um, what you would get from a verbal label to motor cortex activation. So you could have just said bounce a ball, play the piano. So I, I guess I'm trying to understand the evidence that this is an auditory motor link as opposed to just a concept motor link? Yes, so um, your first question, we try to get as much of different types of hand actions as possible. As we said, we've got typing on a keyboard, which is lots of finger action and um, bouncing a basketball, that's more the palm of the hand. So we try to just compensate for all types of hand actions, really. Um, we based this on a pilot experiment, so we did have some other hand object categories as well, and Essentially, these were the five that participants could identify the most. They were more confident and they were more familiar with these and we were obviously more interested in the familiar object categories. So that's why we decided on, on those five, really. Um, do you think there'd be a similarity gradient based on that? Um, potentially, we are going to do, uh, I mean, the classifier can significantly discriminate between each of those individual ones. So although they might be quite similar, the classifier can significantly discriminate between them. Um, 
we did have, say, two exemplars of the same stimulus. So there was one sound of typing on a keyboard and another sound of typing on a keyboard. They're both the same sound, but like individual sounds were different. And we are going to do further analyses to see if um, the two different exemplars of the same sound actually show the same patterns of activity. Um, and the verbal language. Yes, sorry, can you just repeat that one more time? Oh, so you, you had a conclusion, um, uh, it was your fourth bullet point, I think, on your final slide, or, the, um, you, uh, no, sorry, the next one, fifth bullet point, cross modal connections from addition to early somatosensory cortex. So I guess I'm wondering what the evidentiary basis is for that claim from your data, because it seems an alternative would be addition to some sort of verbal, multimodal, label, uh, you know, so like bouncing a ball, that's how you communicated it to us, bouncing a ball, and then from that to somatosensory cortex or motor cortex. So I guess I'm wondering why you think it's mediated directly as opposed to via a ab more abstract representation. Uh, yes, yeah, so not necessarily directly from one to the other. There's probably um, a multisensory area in between that okay. is related through first. It, uh, we're not saying that it's a direct link between the two, but it is transmitting information over. Um, we do plan to also do a connectivity analysis as well to see if we can figure out the pathway through the brain between these two regions. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a direct link, but we, yeah. Very nice study. Um, Thank you. I, I have a curiosity about one of your data points. If I remember correctly, you found a significant decoding um, in premotor cortex for the animal sounds. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you make out of that and how that is compatible with the predictive coding account, assuming I'm not barking usually. Um, yes, so yeah, we do find significant decoding here for the animals when the premotor cortex is pulled together. Um, one thing we do FDR correction, the significant activity is not actually there. Um, it was very close, it was 0.048, so the significance is very, uh, it's not very strong. But the reason why we could find it, it, it could be something to do with embodiment because, I mean, the animal calls, they're moving their mouth, we could be picking up some premotor mouth region, but um, we're not sure, but we don't think it's too much of a problem because when we do the FDR correction, the significance actually disappears. That was really nice. I enjoyed it a lot. I was curious about the difference between left and right S1. Uh, as I recall, you decoding for left but not right. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that and whether in particular it might have to do, it seemed like some of your actions, not typing, but bouncing the basketball, knocking on the door, I the other ones, would have been performed with the right hand but not the left. Do you think it's at all related to that? Uh, yes. Yeah. First of all, you would expect left hemisphere since they were right-handed participants, so that would, that would make sense to find activation in the left uh, postcentral gyrus. However, we do have bimanual hand actions, so yeah, you would think maybe it should be in both hemispheres when we look into this um, hand localizer. However, there is some work by Galvin which suggests that when you have um, bimanual hand movements that it, it's more concerned of the left hemisphere, so again, we would expect from prior um, research that left hemisphere is more dominant for bimanual hand actions. So, a couple of reasons why we think this might be the case. Okay, thanks. I think we have to move on uh, to the next. Sorry. Um, I have got my poster after this as well if anyone has any further questions. So. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next speaker is Ethan Knights. Hello. Oh, can everyone hear me? No, hello. <laughs> hello, anybody hear me? I see some nodding now, that's good. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the introduction, Marius, and thank you for inviting me, it's a real honor. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about decoding typicality with real tools from both the dorsal and ventral visual streams. So, when we look at any objects in the world, according to affordance theories, we automatically uh, perceive what sort of actions they afford, whether it's uh, sitting or standing on a chair, depending on our goal. 
This is very different from other categories of image or stimuli, such as faces or people or scenes that don't afford a specific action. So what I'm talking about today and interested in here is what about certain types of objects like tools that are really manipulable and our knowledge of their function automatically or uh, influence our choice of afforded action on these. So we already uh, suppose that uh, the sort of ventral and dorsal visual pathways in the brain, there may be a communication between these that will lead to the ability to actually use tools. And we know from a, a lot of really nice neuroimaging work that there's a left lateralized and consistently identified set of uh, regions that are really sort of often involved in processing tools in different ways. And you can see many of them here from a nice meta-analysis. Uh, but so far, a lot of these studies have not been uh, interested in, per se, tool use and have had people hearing tools or looking at 2D pictures of tools or action simulations, so pretending to use a hammer and uh, a scanner, for example. And a lot fewer studies have actually had people looking at a real 3D tool or actually interacting with a real 3D tool. So this is what I'm interested in and what I'll talk to you about today. So we're interested in which brain areas may represent typical grasping of a real 3D tool. So when I talk about typical grasping or continuous use, uh, our participants are in the scanner and they are uh, interacting with in a way that's typical, atypical. So you can see uh, grabbing the handle is this sort of affords the next action, right? Whereas in the atypical condition, grabbing the business end. So it's not consistent with its use. Uh, we did with three different 3D printed objects. Objects were naive to this typicality manipulation. So participants simply hear left or they hear right. And uh, what's really important about this is when we come to our analyses, we don't want to just be coming up with uh, different sensitivities or increased activity in regions because it's related to reach direction, so left versus right. So what we've also got is our participants grabbing uh, 3D printed non-tools as well. So here, I hope you'll agree with me that grabbing these non-tools on the left or right side won't evoke such a strongly sort of motor affordance, like a well-learned action. So these objects uh, are designed to share features so that uh, certain kinematic processes are controlled, such as grip aperture, reach distance, so people are grabbing where the black marks are on the object, as well as elongation. So to do this in the scanner, we have a large turntable apparatus that participants lay in, and they have the object presented in the table over their waist, and they can then reach out and actually interact with these objects. Importantly, the head is tilted upwards so that participants can see the objects without any need for mirrors, so it's a bit more natural and we also then dim the light. The, um, we're using these as a fixation and for stimulus presentations, seeing that they're not looking at the object. Importantly, we've also got some cameras pointed at the eye and the hand to ensure that people are doing what we're hoping they're doing. So it's a block design in fMRI, and as you can see by the different colors indicated here, there, all the conditions come up once per run. And we did this with 19 people with 18 reps per person over six runs. And really importantly, on the top left, you can see uh, the sort of on-off block protocol that the uh, experiment followed for each condition. So participants hear left or they hear right. Then the on-block begins for 10 seconds, and they simply reach out and grab uh, precision grass so with the two fingers every time the light comes on, so every time they see the object, essentially. And they do this five times over the on block. And then for the off block, they just continue fixating as they have been, and no response is necessary. So here's a quick video, which is sped up if you can see the object flashing and grabbing each time. Let's give you an indication. OK, so in a separate session, then participants returned to the NHS facility, and we got a perceptual localizer and we defined uh, independent regions of interest to then run our analyses in later. And you can see a lot of the blue cubes, we've identified parts of the sort of canonical, I described very briefly earlier, like the premotor cortices and the supramarginal gyrus. We've also 
started off parts of the lateral occipital temporal cortex and the intraparietal sulcus that are sensitive to different categories of stimuli, such as to tools or such. So you mean the LATC hand, LATC tool. From here, we then have our regions of interest and we've ran multi-voxel pattern analysis. So what we've done is trained and tested support vector machines on the typical and atypical trials for the tools and for the non-tools separately. So what we then get is a decoding accuracy, so we can see if we can discriminate between typical versus atypical uh, for the, the non-tools separately. Firstly, we can compare this against chance to see if they are indeed having any sort of neural code for this information. And then we can also test or compare the difference in this accuracy between the conditions and ensure maybe typicality rather than just the sort of left versus right movements the participants are doing with the non-tools. So this is what I'm trying to indicate here is this is the prediction that you would make if a region is indeed um, containing some representational information about typicality, not just reach direction. So the tools be in the blue arrows and we can see that if a region is decoding something about typicality, it will be much stronger for the tools compared to the non-tools that may be at chance, this being 50% of typical an atypical judgment. What we see is that the, um, the hand selective parts of both the IPS and the LOTC show this pattern of results. So not only are they significantly above chance, the decoding accuracy for the tools only, this is indicated by the green star. You can also see this is significantly higher than on the non-tools, so it was also indicated by the yellow star. And we don't see this pattern of results for any of the other regions in LOTC or IPS, like LOTC tool or body. Nor do we see this in any of the other sort of canonical tool network regions that we often talk about. So, for example, posterior fusiform uh, seems to be maybe containing information about both left and right movements because it's able to discriminate between the conditions for the tools as well as the non-tools. As an aside, I really wanted to mention very quickly uh, the univariate contrast. We've run two. So here you can see specific activity for grabbing the tools in a way that is typical compared to grabbing them atypically or grabbing the non-tools in any orientation at all. So again, what we see is these tool network regions like the middle occipital or posterior middle temporal or even the supermarginal gyri, a very small blob, seems to be active more for grabbing a tool in a way that's used, so it seems to depend on how it's going to be used. And what I really want to draw your attention to is this really large patch of activity we also see in the anterior temporal lobe. So to summarize what I've shown you with the multivoxel pattern analysis first, we saw that hands parts of the left IPS and LOTC automatically represent how to correctly grasp real 3D tools for use. So what I think is quite interesting is that occurred in naive subjects, so the informed information automatically evoked. Participants weren't these after being instructed to grab them, to use them in a certain way. They were simply told left or right. And I think this is quite similar to sort of seminal Tucker and Ellis work where the task was irrelevant to what was actually being measured, such as making an inverted judgment. And then this affects the sort of motor response that's needed to then complete that. Uh, additionally, it's quite consistent with other fMRI work where we see that both the IPS and LOTC generally uh, contains activity patterns that can again discriminate between different types of actions like grabbing or reaching or watching someone cut versus peel. But what I think is really most interesting here is that we already know that hand and tool selective parts of both LOTC and IPS uh, do proximally overlap, they're often very closely to located. Uh, but well, and also we've seen that uh, LOTC hand and tool both increase in activity when making judgments about a tool's action. What we see here is that maybe there's some more functional differences between these, part of these regions too. So here we saw that only the hand selective, not the tool selective parts of both LOTC and IPS uh, represent typicality. So there may be some more functional differences too. Finally, I just wanted to summarize the univariate results you briefly saw. So we saw that the tool network as well as the anterior temporal lobe uh, activity depended on how well an action matched for tool use. So again, consistent with some more fMRI work where we saw that uh, using versus moving a tool to a different location increases a lot of the tool network activity. 
and we've seen that lesions from sort of key hubs that encompass like the supramarginal as well as the posterior middle temporal gyri can it lead to sort of apraxic uh, conditions where there's tall pantomiming deficits. And again, for the anterior temporal lobe, uh, I think conceptually it's consistent with ideas that it could be a sort of maybe semantic hub that's connected to lots of different regions throughout the brain. And again, it's consistent with some other nice recent work showing that uh, this region contains representational information about conceptual, functional, and action knowledge about tools. So this seems to fit there quite nicely. And that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Was there someone else first? No. Okay. Um, I, I had a question about your... Um, the way you phrased your conclusion um, about uh, correct use of tools, sure. um, because the, as I'm sure you know better than I do, there's well-known examples of uh, how you can try and decouple the correctness of how you would grab a tool given a particular goal or context versus its most familiar or canonical way. And in your particular study, those aren't unconfounded, which is fine. I mean, this okay. you're doing already <laughs> Great. Uh, <laughs> amazing work. But, so, but I guess I'm wondering, whether you th so if if you were to design a study where you could decouple those and you could look at how you grab a knife when you mean to chop something versus where you grab a knife when you mean to hand it to someone yeah. um, whether you think this is about the correctness or whether you think it's about the familiarity sure i completely agree with you like the sort of idea that maybe there's differences between like stable and fixed or flexible affordances that yeah we could use a tool to do many different things depending on our goal and maybe uh, maybe correctness wasn't the best term I could have used there to say how we're interacting with it maybe when I was talking about correctness I was saying as long as you're listening to my instruction of left or right then you're correct but but no I completely agree with you and I think there's many other ways we could manipulate it like grabbing to move something or use or move something is a really nice one or how you described passing it to someone because then often you give them the handle right so I think there's many ways we could further go on this and manipulate these in different ways and see if these sort of hand selective regions I've shown here may again represent the sort of, maybe not the typical, but the correct goal output that we wanted. So if the goal was to hand it to someone, then maybe these hand selective regions would again be able to discriminate a better way to grab it, to hand it, even if that would be the opposite to here. But yeah, I think that's a nice question. Nice work. Um, I'm just wondering why you had the subjects use a precision grip uh, like this instead of a power grip, which both for your, yeah. your tools and even your non-tool stimuli would be a more natural way to, to grab things of that uh, yeah. size and weight distribution. Yeah, that's a good question. That's something I considered quite a long time during the design of the study. And I think one of the nice things about and the reason I did do it is so that I could follow it up more easily with motion tracking methods so I could really more easily see the difference in the grip aperture when I'm recording it later. And I found that a lot easier to record with precision than power grip. But I know what you mean. Is it really that typical to grab the tool in the way where, I don't know, you wouldn't often cut with just the two fingers on the, blade, the handle of the knife? So I think that's something that could really be considered further. But I think it's nice that this still sort of almost worked in a sense without the power grip. But I think that's an open question. OK, one more question in the back. Very nice uh, project, but are you sure there is typicality you're distinguishing and not uh, asymmetric types of grasps for the two types of objects from the this place you showed that the type of grip you would do on the right or left of the non-tools seem to be the same, whereas for the tools they are asymmetrical, and so perhaps you're not capturing typicality but just the differences in, in grasp. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying because this worried me a lot as I was going through when I realized this. So one thing I tried to do was sort of see maybe what I could be decoding for the tool specifically could have been related to, as you say, asymmetrical properties like grip. Uh, so what I did for this was to sort of check whether any a new support vector machine was able to discriminate between grabbing objects that were large versus small, because this was the sort of asymmetrical thing between the tools and the non-tools. 
Um, what we see is that where the pink arrows you see here, these are the IPS and LOTC hands that I've been talking about. And it seems as though they're not driven, well, they're not able here to decode significantly above chance, grabbing big versus small. So grabbing, I think, was the pizza cutter versus the spoon. So I think, although you may be right, it may be involved in some way, I don't think that's what's driving these results, that it may be asymmetric. But yeah, it's a really good point. Thank you. OK, thanks again. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, in this. So in the study, we um, investigated how the brain processes the meaning of words. And we did it by focusing on a specific phenomenon that is called concreteness effect. Concreteness effect is uh, a phenomenon that has been found quite robustly in the literature in psychology. And is based on the observation that abstract words, such as free of them, are more difficult to identify than concrete words in terms of reaction time and accuracy. And it has been found in a bunch of uh, cognitive tasks such as lexical decision tasks, word naming tasks, and memory tasks. So why do we have such processing advantage for concrete words? This phenomenon is usually being taken um, uh, in favor of an embodied view of lexical semantics, which suggests that the semantic system and the sensory motor system share the same neural resources. Under this view, uh, word meaning comprehension is based on situated simulation in sensory and motor areas of the brain. So for instance, when we process the word red, we would activate the um, visual cortex that recreate the experience of red through so-called sensory simulation, in this case, visual simulation. And according to this framework, concepts with high perceptual information are faster to process. And abstract words are more difficult to process because of their lack of perceptual information which makes their simulation and thus their comprehension more difficult compared to um, uh, perceptually based concrete concepts. In cognitive neuroscience, there is also another bunch of theories that provide an alternative explanation to uh, how the brain processes the meaning of words. And this theory can be uh, labeled, I think, as a model view of lexical semantics. And uh, this theory suggests that word meaning comprehension is based on the activation of concepts which are stored in a modality independent fashions. Under this view, concrete words are faster to process because of modality independent properties of, of their content rather than uh, sensory motor simulation. In this study, we focus on this uh, specific question on whether is situated, is situated simulation, the driving force underlying the concreteness effects. To investigate this question, we, um, uh, we studied the concreteness effect in blind people. And the reason why we decided to, the, the rationale behind the decision of studying the concreteness effect in blind people as a model to investigate this question is that if the semantic system is based on um, the sensory system on reactiv reactivation of experience in the sensory system, then people with different experience should also, sensory experience should also have a different semantics organization. So yeah, the comparison between blinds and sighted individuals uh, is our model to, to investigate whether and how the lack of, of a visual modality in blind people affects the organization, the format of the conceptual system. As in previous concreteness effect study, we focus on concrete and abstract words. But differently from previous study, 
we uh, select two subsets of concrete words, which are concrete multimodal words, which are words that can be experienced through different sensory modalities. So for instance, strong is a word that can refer to a sound, can refer to a smell or a flavor. So it's, it's multimodal in this sense. And concrete UD model visual words, such as red, that are words that can be experienced only through vision. So basically, mostly color words. This last uh, category of concrete words, visual words, allow us to test this prediction of embodied semantics. So because blind people cannot rely on visual simulation during semantic processing, then their processing advantage for concrete unimodal visual words should disappear. It means that purely visual words should be abstract for blind people. On the other side, and a model view of lexical semantics would predict that because the concreteness effect relies on modality independent properties of word meaning, then the processing advantage for concrete unimodal visual words should be the same across the two groups. So we tested 21 early blind individuals and 21 sighted controls. We use lexical decision task and auditory lexical decision task. It is a task in which uh, participants uh, listen to words and they have a press a button when a word exists and another button when uh, the word does not exist and reaction times were collected. Our set of stimuli included 40 abstract words, 40 concrete multimodal words, and 40 concrete unimodal visual words, plus 120 uh, pseudo words. In order to distinguish between uh, abstract and concrete words, we use maximum perceptual strength, that is a measure of how strong a concept can be uh, experienced through, through perception. And as you can see, abstract words uh, on a scale from zero to five. And as you can see, abstract, abstract words are below the range of, of three, whereas uh, multimodal and visual words are very high in terms of maximum perceptual strength. And we use this measure rather than more uh, typical concreteness or imageability ratings, because according to recent studies, this measure outperformed both uh, imageability and concreteness in accounting for variance in uh, lexical decision tasks. And we use modality exclusivity to distinguish between multimodal and visual, uh, unimodal visual words. Modality exclusivity is a measure of the degree to which a concept can be experienced uh, within a single sensory modality on a scale from zero to 100, <clears throat> where 100 is a concept that is completely unimodal and zero is a concept that is completely multimodal. And as you can see, visual words are around 86% of modality exclusivity, whereas uh, multimodal words were below the threshold of 50. And our set of items uh, were also matched across the three conditions for number of syllables, number of phonemes, frequency, familiarity, and other psycholinguistic variables. So what we found in, in the site it is a classical concreteness effect, effect with abstract word being um, slower compared to both multimodal and visual words. And here we didn't find any difference between these two uh, concrete category of words. And surprisingly, we found the same effect, <clears throat> the same pattern in blind people. So again, abstract word being uh, slower than both uh, concrete unimodal visual words and concrete multimodal words. These results suggest that the lack of visual experience does not, does not impair the processing of words with meaning referring to visual dimension. Thus, the concreteness effect is not necessarily dependent on reenactment of visual experience. And these results also suggest that modality independent properties of words meaning may be the driving force underlying the concreteness effect. Yeah, these are the people that are involved in this study and that helped me preparing this uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks, that was great. Um, and before I ask my question, I should say that there were 10 of us at lunch who spent an hour debating what words like abstract and amodal and multimodal meant. So <laughs> I, I'm perfectly primed for this uh, great talk. Um, I don't understand the amodal hypothesis you offered. Um, and I'm wondering if you could help me understand why um, under the so you had the one hypothesis based on the embodied cognition account, and you had a set of predictions from that. And that I understood. But the alternative set of predictions you had was based on, I guess, some work I don't know 
that suggests that um, uh, color information is somehow amodal in a sense that abstract information is not. And I, I'm not, that's what I don't understand. If there's an amodal representation, I'm not understanding why abstract words wouldn't also tap into that, and therefore you would have no concreteness effect. So I, there's some piece of the logic there that I'm not quite getting. So, well, I think, I think this, um, yeah, this study tests the, the hypothesis of embodiment, that the difference between concrete and uh, abstract words is based on the amount of, of perceptual information. Right, yeah. versus the, what's the alternative? The a model view that suggests that the difference is based on some modality independent factors. It's not clear w which they are. Indeed, I think okay. the, the, the main focus of this experiment is whether it's perceptual simulation, the, the motor underlying the concreteness effect. Then I think these results fits well in a, in a, a model view of lexical semantics. But, but in an amodal view, yeah. so go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we don't have a very clear cut prediction okay. for, for uh, a model semantics. So you have a view that there's some amodal view of semantics, that if you tap into that, it facilitates your response time and gives you a concreteness effect, and that both multimodal and unimodal concepts tap into that system, but, co but abstract concepts do not? Um, yes, probably there okay. are some modality independent factors that in concrete words, I mean in the, um, yeah, in what we usually uh, describe as concrete, define as concrete words that speed up their performance. That is not based on the uh, sensory content of okay. words. Okay, but you don't know what it's based on yet. Okay. Yeah, is that right? Okay, thank you. You should have been at lunch. Um, thanks, a nice study. Um, I have a question regarding the early blind uh, participants. So early blind, what does it mean? So, so th these are not congenitally? Congenitally blind people. That right. basically they had never seen a color. Then this answers already my question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Mikael Ramot. Okay. So uh, thank you for the award. It's a pleasure to be here. And in a sense, this, this is kind of looking at the question of recognition memory from the exact opposite end of what uh, Nicole presented earlier. Because for single units, we're looking at the whole brain with fMRI. So it's kind of a very different take on, this, on a similar question. So we start with this observation. Within the general population, there's a huge variance in how good people are at recognizing faces. All right, so on the one hand, you might have people like me who get confused if two characters in the movie have the same haircut. And on the other end, you have women who recognize on the street, out of context, someone in kindergarten. Right, so there's a lot of uh, But this variance has really been studied mostly, at least in human fMRI studies, within the context of no visual face region. You have FFA. Or is really not much out of the region. So what we wanted to do was to take a whole approach, testing state, functional, and the other key regions which might also rely this recognition memory process. It's a behavioral test for face memory. This is the Cambridge face memory test. This is the standard face memory test people will generally use. And if you're not familiar with it, you study a few faces, and then you have to say out of three faces which was the familiar face. Okay, it's actually it's a really difficult task. I fail at this <laughs> miserably. Um, people are on average at about 80% accurate on this. And we have we want to test. So we also use the Cambridge car memory test, which is exactly the same cars. Okay. So this we do outside the scanner before the scan session. And then after this behavioral test, we put people in the scanner. We do two nine-minute rest scans. We do two face scene localizers. And we use the localizer to identify the face patches. Right? 
OFA, FFA, amygdala, and this ATL, the more anterior face patch region, which is most face identical. So we're going to start with a slightly more traditional approach, so looking within the face regions. And what we're looking at here is the correlation between the beta values in the face areas. When I say face areas, this is just a, an average of all our face patches and the scene regions. So we have uh, the dark blue bars represent the face betas, the light blue uh, the scene betas, and the pink the face minus scene. Right? We have this within the face areas and within the scene areas, and the y-axis is the beta value, it's the correlation values that came with the test. Okay? So what we see here is that the more selective, right? So the higher the face minus beta in the face areas, the better people are at the Cambridge face memory test. Okay? So the more selective the scene areas are to scene, the better they are at representing faces. Okay, and this is during the localizer. So this is during the task localizer. Now we want to go to what happens outside of face ROIs. Right? And we want to take a closer look at the whole brain connectivity during rest. So the way we're going to do this, because I like second order correlations, is we're going to start with the seed region. And then for each voxel in the brain, the seed region for all our participants. Right? So this is one voxel. We can do this for all our voxels. So for each voxel, we have for each participant the correlation of that voxel to our seed region. Right? Then we also have our Cambridge face score, the score on the Cambridge face test. And what we can do now is calculate the correlation for each voxel between the correlation to our seed and the Cambridge face memory. Right? So for each voxel, we get a single value, which is really how predictable the correlation in that voxel is to ATL, or to our seed region, performance on the face memory test. Okay? So we do this for each voxel, and we get a, a value for that voxel. These are the values that we're interested in. Okay, so all the analyses I'm going to show from now on, all the maps I show, these are the values in the maps. It's this correlation of correlations. So we're going to start with the ATL seed. So we did this for all our we looked at all our visual face seeds. Right? And we on ATL because that one had by far the most extensive uh, effect. And what we see is, for starters, so this is addictive, the correlation of these voxels to ATL is for performance on the face memory test. So we don't see the other face patches so much, right? They are missing. What we do see are these somatosensory regions, right? And these are specifically face three regions. We also see right? And now if we look at the volume, just so we get a better sense of what's going on, we have and this is the parapetal region that we defined. So what we're going to do now is expand our network. Right? So we started with the face seeds, and now we're going to define more seeds that are behaviorally relevant using this connectivity analysis. And because we have two rest scans, the way we're going to find them on one rest scan, and then we're going to put them on two rest scans, so we have an independent data set. Right, so we're defining them on the first rest scan, then we're testing them on the second scan. So throughout this, the blue lines are going to signify new RIs that we define, and the green ones are the RIs that we already defined. Okay? Okay, so now we're going to pair up the campus as a seed, do the same one, and we're going to look which region, the correlation of which region with parabacanthus predict face memory performance. I see data set. So this is a nice replication of the finding we had in the first dress scan. And then the other thing we get is the medial parietal region. Right? So parabacanthus is a, is a known memory region. The medial parietal, not so much, but if you saw Adrian, Adrian uh, yesterday, then this is also an area associated with memory. Uh, and this is, again, look at the volume. So, so I have a campus. So we're going to use that as a seed as well. And now we're going to go back to the sensory seed that we defined before. And when we use this, we get, again, ATL. And again, this medial parietal region. Right? So we're starting to see a network of interact together. And the interaction between them is predictable of 
Okay, so your parietal is a seed. But again, our paracampal area. Right, so we have all these areas kind of coming together. So finally, we're going to look at the campus. And here we have very widespread uh, correlations or predictive correlations, right? So, but some of the same still coming up. So we have the medial parietal region, we have the campus, uh, and this is just looking at the volume just to see how extensive this is. Okay, so now what we can do is we can power our, right, all the, start with the that we and all these new ROIs that we defined for the computational analysis, and look at the how predictive the connections are. Uh, so we have this correlation matrix, and this is again second order correlation. So these are not the correlations between the areas, but how predictive the correlation between these areas are of the performance on the trace memory. And this is the full correlation matrix. We're going to look at this, which is the p value matrix. And maybe unintuitively, green is more uh, <laughs> significant than red. And the first thing you see is that what is really missing are the correlations between the face patches. They're not actually that predictive of performance on the face memory task. Most so now we wanted to ask, is this specific for faces? And we remember we have the Cambridge car memory test, so we do the same analysis with the Cambridge car memory, and mostly it is specific for faces, right? So there are some exceptions, right? So this parahippocampal and FFA for some reason, and parahippocampal and the medial parietal are significant for, for objects. But mostly, most of the regions we found seem to be specific for faces. So to summarize uh, this, we see the network, networks which underpin face memory extend well beyond traditional face patches. Right? These include memory-related regions, medial temporal lobe, hippocampus, parahippocampus, medial parietal, and we also find the somatosensory regions. These networks are largely selected for face memory, a few exceptions, but they, they seem to be related specifically to faces, not just the memory of the and my, one of my main takeaways from this is that over analysis is one of the biggest advantages that fMRI has over other things, and we should really be using it much more often. So moving forward, it also goes back to the talk. What we want to do is now we've identified this network, and we have these correlations between networks and behavior. We don't really know what they mean. So we want to the networks and see what happens. We still have optogenetics in humans, but we can do neurofeedback. And this is a paper that we published last year. And we did this on an AP data set. And we want to do the same thing on faces and see what happens. So I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, fantastic postdocs who worked on this, uh, the other members of my lab, and the very young Alex, who's much younger than the other people here. So thank you very much. So that's really, really exciting. So uh, could you just tell us, tell us two sentences more about the ideas for neurofeedback? So, so the idea is you're changing the images on the screen dependent on brain activity, or what is it? Yes, neurofeedback happens to be my favorite topic, so I can talk about it a lot. Um, what we're doing with neurofeedback is an implicit neurofeedback. The rewards are orthogonal to whatever we're training. So what we're doing is measuring a network. We're aiming for a specific network state. And then when we see that network state, we reinforce it. And the reward has nothing to do with the network. So in this case, we, it's hard to move away from visual reward because it's the most rewarding. So we are using visual rewards, but they have nothing to do with faces or objects. They're very abstract. And it's just that whenever we see the networks that we want, we show a piece of a puzzle, right? And they, their task is to finish the puzzle, and they get very excited about it. They get a score. They can try and improve. And, but it, it's really just directly reinforcing the network that we want to change. And that's the same thing we did before, and it works. So, Very cool. Am I next? Is that, um, I have two statistical questions, but first a comment, which is either your face recognition is way, way worse than you uh, self-described, or you have two people that you work with called Jason Crutcher. Oh. <laughs> I'm just Sorry. teasing you. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> okay, but my my real my real it's question. It's Jason Avery. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my so my question. So the first is um, when you showed the car, um, the matrix of uh, correlations correlations with the car. Mm -hmm. I wasn't clear if what you were showing us was um, another thresholded uh, matrix of correlations between correlations, or whether you were showing us pairs of regions where the difference between the face and car correlations was significant. Could you just clarify if you did that statistical test? No, I haven't done that statistical test, although uh, I, ha I haven't done it yet, but I'm sure it'll be significant because there are no correlations. I didn't show you the full correlation matrix, yeah. but they're basically zero. Okay. There's in all the other regions, and they're very strong for the face. Okay. Map. But no, this was Okay, that was just another threshold. Yes. Okay. And then my second question, um, is in thinking about the null results you found about, you know, you commented a couple of times that the face-face correlations weren't predictive of behavior. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that could be, but one could be that they, those correlations tend to have more of a restricted range across your 30 or so participants in that they might be really high. In other words, if you have two regions of the brain that are very highly correlated in your resting state data, then there wouldn't be enough variation to detect covariation. Another possibility is there's equivalent variation and it's just not predictive. How do you how do you suss out which of those two it is when, you, when you're looking at these second order correlations? Right, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. What I, what I didn't show because I don't have time to show was we also showed them a movie. And if we do the same analysis during the movie as during rest, then the face-face correlations do become significant. So it might be something, so it's not just variation because they're probably more correlated during the movie than during rest, although that's an interesting question. I'll have to check that. Um, but yeah, like it, it could go either way. So uh, I'm not, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. I have to think about it, how you know if it's just they're too highly correlated to the experience. That's true. Okay, thank you. So our last speaker of this session is Simone Vigano. Can you hear me? Okay. So today's presentation is about uh, how uh, symbolic categorization shapes neural representations of newly acquired objects. Uh, it's uh, it doesn't work. Okay. It's uh, um, undeniable that our um, experience of depends on exploration of multisensory information, and as humans, we use symbols to organize such a perceptual space into categories that are the building blocks for our concept conceptual knowledge to emerge. However, the neural uh, correlates underlying this process are largely unexplored. And that is why we ask the question of what happens in our brain when we learn to use symbols to parse a multisensory perceptual space into categories, uh, into recognizable objects. So we decided to move from the ecological and natural, um, from the ecological natural environment to the artificial but more controlled uh, experimental setting. And we did that by creating 16 multisensory animated objects that shared the very same shape you can see in this, in this little cartoon and that varied in their size and in the pitch of an associated sound they produced during a little squeezing animation. To create them, we ran um, psychophysical validation on each participant. Uh, to And uh, mm, we crossed the now uh, then we divided this uh, perceptual space into four categories. 
not sorry, okay. by adding two uh, sensory boundaries, one along sides and one along P, and uh, we gave to each category an abstract or novel name. So for instance, now object is an exemplar of the category. We tried for nine days uh, in order to make them learn these object name association. And uh, crucially, we collected the neural correlates evoked by the presentation of both objects and names before and after learning. Uh, for time reasons, I won't go into the details of the training, uh, but feel free to ask me if you are interested. Uh, during both the fMRI mm, sessions, participants were presented with uh, uh, a pseudo-random sequence uh, of objects and names. And they performed two kinds of tasks. During the first fMRI, they just performed a one-back task on stimulus identities, meaning that they had to press a button any time they detected an immediate repetition of the very same stimulus, no matter object or name. In the second fMRI day, besides performing again the same task, on different runs, they performed a one-back task on category identity, where they had to press a button any time an object was preceded or followed by its name. And we introduced this task because we wanted to uh, amplify, at these early stages of learning, the access to categorical representations. Uh, all the uh, new imaging results I will um, show you in the next slides refer to the category. Uh, participants performed very well during both fMRI sessions, meaning that our objects were recognizable and that they had learned the categorical memberships. So as I said, the aim of the project was to uh, investigate uh, and to describe the neural changes occurring after learning. And we started by characterizing these changes in uh, um, sensory regions. We uh, isolated brain regions that were responding selectively to the acoustic or to the visual components of our objects. And we did that by using uh, the results of a functional unisensory localizer to mask the brain activity evoked by the presentation of multisensory objects during the main task. And this result in a, resulted in a um, bilateral um, network of uh, uh, regions of interest uh, comprised of anterior superior temporal gyros for the acoustic part and the lateral, lateral occipital complex for the um, visual part. Then we extracted the neural dissimilarity between pairs of objects varying along one dimension per time. So for instance, we calculated the neural dissimilarity between object one and object three that varied only in their size because they had the same pitch and between object one and nine that varied in their pitch but had the same size. And we showed that, starting from visual areas, the neural dissimilarity between objects that varied along size was uh, increasing after learning while the neural dissimilarity between objects that varied in their pitch decreased after learning. And crucially, we observed the opposite areas. That means that these sensory regions, after learning, increased their sensitivity to the preferred sensory modality and decreased their sensitivity for differences along the non-preferred one. Thus, in fact, they showed sensory segregation. Next, we are. Uh, we were able to detect unique multisensory object identities. Now, uh, we all know that many brain regions uh, uh, support multisensory integration, but we decided to um, proceed with an hypothesis-free approach. So we implemented um, a whole brain searchlight. And within each sphere, we conducted a split alpha. unique multisensory object identities as the unique combinations between a size and a pitch level. That before learning, there was no local such a After learning in the left angular gyrus. And this was quite surprising because first of all, the behavioral performance in the scanner during the first day was high, as I showed you in the previous slide. And secondly, because the the um, average univariate activity uh, in the left 
loss was already high before learning, and the difference between the two sessions was the same. ...these emergence of object identities in such a detectable way. ...is that during the first fMRI day, all the instances of the same multisensory object were not recognized as such, but as many different and nameless entities, and this would correspond to a high variability in the activity patterns across trials. So we extracted the activity patterns for each single trial during object presentation, and we treated them as vectors in a multidimensional space dimension was a voxel. In this instance, I represented the multidimensional space with just three dimensions. That means patterns of activity evoked by different angular deviation actually decreased, indicating that after learning the representations of our objects were more detectable and more stable, that means more reproducible. And this result was further supported by the fact that despite the average univariate signal was not different between the two sessions, the number of variables that differentiated between our objects Uh, as, the, mm, uh, as our learning was symbolic in nature, we predicted that these neural of objects um, were more similar to that we implemented. Uh, is uh, more similar to the neural representation of the corresponding category name, that is care, and it's different from to the other, sorry, to the other category uh, name. To highlight two important controls we implemented. So first of all, uh, we tested whether this effect Interesting the whole brain, or they were regional space. Text and one in the left anterior temporal lobe that it's well known for being involved in categorization. And they didn't show the same changes. on stimulus identity that require explicit association between and we showed that the effects on the, of the trial by trial stability and the cross modal correlation that is the object name correlation um, were higher than and then compared to before learning that means that probably these effects uh, uh, were already um, automatized and targets and so to conclude uh, with this uh, experiment, we had the unique opportunity to describe changes uh, um, in, the, in the brain activity occurring during categorical learning. And these changes uh, affected uh, both the sensory regions that sharpened their sensitivity for the preferred sensory modality and not for the non-preferred modality, and also the uh, associative areas in the inferior parietal lobe, like the angular gyros, that played a key role in integrating sensory signal coming from different senses, and it reorganized its activity to better reflect object identities by reproducing them more stably, uh, by recruiting a higher portion of its uh, cortical territory to discriminate them, and crucially, by developing a common code to represent objects and their names, thus probably playing a key role uh, in moving from perception to more symbolic or conceptual spaces. And that's it. I just wanted to um, thank Manuela and Valentina for 
uh, they supervise the project. And uh, if you have any question, I'm here. Are you sure you don't want to go first, Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, one clarification question. I thought you said at some point when you were describing the task that you were going to focus on the category ID data, but then you showed a pre-post difference. So what did you use for the pre-baseline? Uh, it was just one task. It was a one-back task on stimulus identity. But then the post was the category was identity? It was the category task for the, for the results, neuroimaging results that I showed you here. Okay. Yes. But, okay. Okay. Um, and then the second point was... Um, I, I, again, more of a clarification question. When you, the main effects of differentiation and integration on the two modalities, um, those were on the patterns of activity averaged over trials? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. And then you did a trial by trial analysis and showed that there's reduced variability of the vectors in the multidimensional space. Yeah. So it seems like those are separate uh, effects, right? So. If you had done the trial by trial, if you'd done the pattern analysis at a trial by trial level, it's possible that the reduced variability for a particular object could drive, you know, higher or lower correlations. But because you calculate on the means, it means that there's both reduced variance and greater distance or less distance of the mean vector, right? So how do you think about the relationship between those two? Are those separate learning effects uh, or are those well, separate data, I guess the, is the question. The um, trial by trial stability is actually yeah. in part as well. So um, the information cannot be in the trial by trial right. pattern. Okay. Okay. Oh, you did have a question. Oh yeah. Like I said, age before beauty. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, I want to hear your thoughts about the uh, absence of an effect in left anterior temporal lobe, and even further, why you chose it to be the site of a, a test of it as a negative control. Um, because I'm guessing you peaked in the anter left anterior temporal lobe because of the uh, you know, well-known claims that it is a multimodal integration site for concept representation. Um, so what, do you have thoughts about wh why you didn't see effects there, and, and, and why in, was it your a priori negative control site along with M1? So there might be many, many reasons. Uh, you can just speculate among them. So uh, first of all, we are at the very, very early stages of learning to move from perception to, to, to symbols, right? So uh, it might be that the anterior temporal lobe plays a role at a higher stage of the learning process, of, of the semantic uh, uh, process, OK? Mm -hmm. uh, also, it might be that uh, um, being the anterior temporal lobe in the anterior temporal lobe, in the temporal lobe, sorry, uh, it might be more affected by visual shapes. And here, the visual shapes was completely orthogonal to the task. And uh, to reply to why we, are, we selected that region is exactly because uh, uh, it was uh, indicated also by neuropsychological evidence that it should be involved in constructing categories. But then why choose it as your negative control site? It's just to see, oh, no, it's uh, just to see, okay, I see. Uh, it's just to see whether the, the effect was uh, uh, affecting also other, these effects were also uh, affecting other brain areas. Okay. So for instance, the trial by trial stability pattern, can, I mean, uh, cannot be implemented easily in a searchlight, right? right? So I had to, to proceed with, that, with that, an NRI approach. Well, so maybe I could rephrase my question by saying, if you found the same result in left ATL as you found in, for example, left angular gyrus, would that have disconfirmed some view of the, no. So you, you would have been happy with that result either way. You just wanted to know. Okay, that's what I needed to hear. Thank you. So you showed that these sensory regions increase their sensitivity for these changes in either pitch or size after training. Mm -hmm. Is that specific for changes across the category boundary, or is that similar for changes within the category boundaries? It seems that that, that is a key that is question. The $1 million dollar and the question, and uh, mm, we don't know, actually. Um, it could be just perceptual learning. And uh, I actually uh, tried to test uh, the neural dissimilarity. Let's see if I can just. Mm. Oh, okay. 
we actually tried to test it whether, for instance, object one and object six were, uh, became more different. Because in that case, we are within the, thank you, we are within the, the, the category, right? And the effects were uh, in the middle, meaning that there was a little incre increment, but it was not uh, significantly different from zero, and it was not significantly different from this one. So I actually do not have an answer. Okay, thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks to everybody. We'll be back at 4.30.